great morning, Unity of Brooklyn. And thank you, Tanya and the team for all that you do and continue to do. Our lesson this morning is entitled The Season of Advent. The Season of Advent. And today is the first Sunday of the Advent season, which happens this time each year. And Advent is a period of four Sundays and four weeks in between those Sundays leading up to Christmas Day. It is a season of preparation. In Latin, the word Advent means coming, coming. In traditional Christianity, Advent is recognized as preparation for the coming of the birth of baby Jesus. In unity, we see Advent as preparation for the birth or the rebirth of the Christ spirit that lives eternally within us. It's a time of newness. It's a time of rebirthing the Christ and rising to a new level of understanding, unfolding to a new level of understanding. So the first lesson in Advent throughout the Christian world is faith, faith. And that's what we're talking about today, faith. Do you notice how faith is always first? Faith is the first power in the 12 powers. Faith is the first Sunday in the Advent season. So wherever there is a Christian church today, faith is the lesson for the day. Much, much, much is based in life on faith. And so today, this morning, Brian read the scripture from Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. And what I'd like to share for you for share with you for a little bit is some more of that scripture through 39. I'm not going to read the entire scripture one through 39, but there are parts of that scripture that are important to us to know in terms of this lesson today. Verse eight in Hebrews 11 tells us that by faith and works, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, built an ark to save his family. It goes on to say that by faith and obedience, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he went, even though he did not know where or why he was going. By faith and works, he made his home in the promised land. By faith, the scripture says, Joseph, when he was dying, relayed his vision of the exodus of the Israelites to others. By faith and works, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, and they were not fearful of the king's commandment. And I want to point out that by faith and fairness, people sought out the counsel of the prophet Deborah. Verse 32 goes on to say, I do not have time to tell you about Gideon and Barak and Samson and David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised whose weaknesses were turned into strength. These people, the scripture says, were all commended for their faith, even though they only saw and welcomed the vision from a distance. Even though they only saw the vision in their mind and in their heart from a distance, they welcomed it and worked toward it. I want to point out and back up to verse 15. 
And if you leave this lesson today with nothing else, leave this lesson with verse 15, which you may want to read after today's service. It reads, if they had been thinking of where they had left, they would have not, they, they would have had the opportunity to return. Let me say that again. If they had been thinking of where they left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Think about that. And think about that and its application and its practicality in today's life. If we keep thinking and we continue to think of where we left, where we were at some other point in life in the past, if we continue to think about that, it opens the opportunity for us to return there or to return to that situation. The scripture goes on to say, instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God had prepared a city for them. You see, they did not allow the pain and the chaos of the past to define their present or their future. Toni Morrison, an author, a book editor, and most of us know her, and she's also chair of humanities at Princeton. Toni Morrison said that chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge and even wisdom. Chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge and even wisdom. So you see, those times in life, when there's chaos all around us, we can see, yes, we can see and we can feel, we can observe the chaos, but we cannot sink down into the chaos. Within the chaos, there is understanding, there is knowledge, there is wisdom. And as truth students and as ambassadors of truth, that's how we want to look at all situations. Look into the situation, let it, let not, take not on the chaos, take not on the confusion, but look at the situation, look for the good in the situation, look for the wisdom in the situation, the lesson in the situation, Pull that out, draw that out, and live that lesson. So what is the spiritual principle that we can grasp today from 11, Hebrews 11, verse 15 and 16? Once again, that being focused on the past provides the opportunity to return to the past. And that's not necessarily a physical return to the past but a return to the past mentally and emotionally. To return to the past by holding on to it and holding on to it and holding on to it. Faith is a future. Faith is holding a vision of the future. So if we hold the vision of the past, there is a chance, there is an opportunity to return to that situation. Now, Many of the Bible characters who were demonstrating faith, they were mocked, they were stoned, they were scorned, they were wanderers in the desert, in mountains, sometimes living in caves at times. Others traveled wearing skins and sheep, goat, sheep, skins of sheep and goats. And there were other people who looked down on these folks. Can you imagine it? They looked down on these folks and they saw them as needy and destitute and not worthy. But you know, these folks longed for a better way. They longed for a better way of life and they pressed on to the higher calling. They kept the faith and they put action. They put works with the faith and pressed on to higher calling. So we can see that faith is assuredness of something in the future that is not yet visible to the human eye. 
faith is something in the future that is not yet visible to the human eye. And not everyone will believe that which is not visible to the human eye. But those of us who are looking and working towards spiritual development know that what is invisible, that what is visible is created from what is invisible. So faith is an assurance, but you must remember this, faith must be accompanied by actions. The scripture calls it works. Actions directed by the Holy Spirit. You see, faith without works is dead, as the scripture tells us. Charles Fillmore, one of the two co-founders of the Unity Movement, says that faith is the link between the vision in mind and the manifestation. So the vision or the picture in the mind or the thought in the mind and the actual thing itself, what is between that? What is between that and what draws that to us and draws us to it is faith. Faith is deeper than belief. Faith is assuredness. Belief can change from one day to another. I believe today is sunny doesn't mean it's sunny. But faith is assuredness. So what have been some of your experiences, some of your faith-filled experiences that you can remember? Because if you think back on some of those experiences and really, sometimes we forget, but if you think back and you, you look at what it is you were so faith-filled about and you held on to it, and you didn't let it go. You turned it every which way but loose. And then you put some action with it. You went this way, you tried that, you did this, and you moved closer and drew it. Faith. You see, hope, and a lot of times we talk, you know, I hope. I, I hope this, I hope that. Hope is a beginning stage in faith. It's better than nothing at all, but it is a beginning. Hope is a beginning, while faith is a assuredness. Hope is a desire. Think with me. When we hope something happens, or we hope someone will do or not do something, or we hope someone will say or not say something, the power to do or not do, the power to say or not say, is really in the hands of that someone else. Mm. When we hope, the power is really in the hands of that someone else to do or not do, to say or not say. But when hope evolves to assured faith with works, manifestation is experience. Hebrews 11 and 3 once again reminds us that what is seen is made of what is not seen. Hmm. Think of a farmer who plants seeds. The farmer has faith that the seeds will develop roots to sustain the crop. If the farmer did not have that faith, the farmer would not plant the seeds in the first place. So the farmer plants the seed in faith that they will develop roots and the crops will grow. Now, while the roots are invisible, like the vision, the roots are invisible on the surface of the soil. In faith, the farmer doesn't return in doubt to dig root each day. That really would be doubt. So if the farmer did return each day and dig up some soil to see if it had developed roots or not, the roots would never develop because the farmer would be disturbing 
the development of the whatever he is growing or she is growing. So faith is not something that we, we say we have faith. We say we keep the faith. But if we keep digging up and doubting and questioning ourselves or questioning the situation or even sometimes questioning God, we can expect to not so easily manifest that which we have in our heart and in our mind. Hear what the Reverend Eric Butterworth said about faith. Eric said that God is centered in you and in me. God is centered in you and in me always, he said. The question is, Eric says, what is your consciousness centered in? If your thought is centered in the material world, he says, if it is centered in difficulty, if it is centered in the news of the day, he says, if it is centered in an idea of everything happens to me, this is going to frustrate the flow of divine energy. Hear that again. If our consciousness is centered in negativity, in fear, in doubt, it frustrates and interrupts the flow of divine energy. Let's look, let's look at that a little, a little deeper with a little more practicality. If our consciousness, if our mindset, if our thinking, if our feeling is centered in what we are not sure of, is centered in the material world, is centered in a difficulty that we're experiencing right now, or is centered in the victim mentality of why is this happening to me? Why does everything happen to me? We cannot expect to experience the flow of divine ideas because there's already a thought in our mind and a feeling in our heart. And two thoughts cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So the thought and the feeling, the feeling with the greatest energy, the greatest and the deepest vibration, that is what gets to be expressed. That is what is manifested. He goes on to say, God is centered in you. He says that the kingdom of all potentiality is already within you and within me. Positive faith, and listen to this phrase that he uses, positive faith is the key to the kingdom. Now, why would he say positive faith? Can faith be negative? Better believe it. Faith is a principle and principle works and doesn't need us to work in order for it to work. So if we take the principle of faith and we apply it negatively, negatively if we apply faith to illness, to becoming ill, if we apply negative faith to something that someone is going to do or that we're going to do. Faith's responsibility is to work wherever we place it. To do its work however we use it. So it, faith can be worked as any principle in the positive or in the negative. So Eric does go on to say that positive faith is the key to the kingdom. You see, faith does not change divine reality. Faith changes our perception of reality with an uppercase R. Reality with an uppercase R represents God. 
Faith brings us into alignment with divine reality. And so when our heart and our mind are in alignment with divine reality, with God, then we experience manifestation. Remember that the ancient cultures once believed that the world was flat. Can you remember that? That the ancient cultures once believed that the world was flat. The fact that they believed that the world was flat did not make the world flat. That was their perception of reality. It did not, their belief did not change the geometrical reality of the earth being a circular sphere. Their belief did not change the shape of the earth their perception had to change. So back then it was the faith and the works of Aristotle that ushered in that truth in conscious alignment with reality. It was his works, studying, observing, experimenting, and it was his faith steady on the task in what he was learning and realizing and proving that shifted the ancient thinking of the masses of people. It was his faith and his works that diligently working at it, continuing to have the faith and doing what was necessary that changed the masses of the people. And from then in the fifth century, from the fifth century until now, the 21st century, we ascertain that the earth is roughly a sphere. We no longer believe that the earth is flat. We know better, so we do better. So you see, it's not that reality changes. The world did not change from flat to circular. It was always circular, but the perception of that changed. The perception of that one person and getting others to work along with him and doing the necessary works of experimenting and observing and studying that changed the perception and brought it into alignment with reality. Here the epistle that's attributed to James, James, this particular James, there are three James in the Bible. This particular James is the brother of Jesus. And sometimes he's called James the least. And he is speaking, the writer is speaking in James to a group of Jewish Christians, a, gr a group of Jewish folks who had converted to Christianity and huh, they are looking down at other people. This is James 2, 14 through 18. And so the writer says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Listen to verse 17. In the same way, faith by itself, the scripture says, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. And then the scripture goes on in verse 18 to say, but some of you will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Imagine that. That people are saying to this writer, you have faith. And this one over here, they have deeds. So perhaps the thinking was if we put it together, uh, we could manifest this thing. No, 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 no. That's not the way 
the principle of faith works. That's like saying, you have the rice and you have the gravy. And if we put it together, we'll have a meal. Or you have the cake and I have the ice cream. So if we put it together, we'll have a nice dessert. Mm -mm. This is the response of the writer to those who said, you have the faith and I have the deeds. He says, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by deeds. He says that God has promised people who are poor in the eyes of the world, but rich in faith to inherit the kingdom of heaven as well as everyone else. You see, this group of folks were looking down at people who did not have what they had. At the same time that those who had more than them materially were looking down on them. Faith without how often have we said, and I know that we've all said, myself included, at some time in life, we've said, I'm gonna, I will, I might, maybe if, that's hope, not faith. So faith alone without work, faith alone without action, faith alone will have deeds, does not qualify for manifestation. Faith must be accompanied by works. And we want to be not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. So as we walk by faith and works, my friends, and not by human sight alone, we continually awaken and build our confidence and our assuredness in the invisible Christ presence, the spirit of Christ living within us. It is being birthed, it is being born again anew. Not only at Christmas, but every day. So in this season of preparation, in this season of what we expect on Christmas Day or by Christmas Day, and some of us even before Christmas Day, what we will experience is a new level of understanding, a new birth, a rebirth to a higher or deeper understanding of who and whose we are, of life, of situations, of experiences, a new understanding as Christ is born in us anew. Christ within us is our hope of glory. Amen, amen, and amen. So take a deep breath. Just release it as slowly as you can. And know that faith in Christ within is our hope of glory. That's where all of our answers lie, where our direction comes from. And we are grateful. We are thankful. And so it is.